Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Jumbo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Coming to you from the beautiful Reedville neighborhood in Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very happy that you're joining us today. This is a really powerful episode of the show, and I think you'll see there are a couple places where I am at a loss for words. Our guest today is A. LaFay, Alexandria LaFay. She's t- here to tell us about her really powerful book, Follow Me Down to Nicodemus Town. Before Alexandria joins us, I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about my educational magic show, We Choose Respect. You know, this is my, my conversation with Alexandria was, was very difficult in, in points because the, the, the things that Alexandria is talking about are very difficult. I've been committed for, for decades to use my magic, my storytelling, my ability to create illusions to inspire kids to always choose to be respectful, to respect themselves, to make healthy choices for their lives, to respect their communities and to show respect to each and every person they meet. I'm so thrilled to hear from 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 kids and parents and teachers that the show is really really effective and that kids talk about the show for weeks after seeing the performance. I know the chances are that you're not the person who chooses what enrichment programs to bring into a school or a library or a church, but you probably know the people who do make those decisions. The school principal, the guidance counselors, the um, head of the PTA or PTO, the youth minister, the youth pastor, the librarian down at your public library. If you would take a minute to visit my website, jedley.com, J-E-D-L-I-E, jedley.com, find out a little bit about the show, bring that information to those decision makers. They'd be really, really appreciative because they have so much going on in their lives. And I'd be really appreciative, too. And I think most of all, you'll be really thankful you did, too, because it will make a difference in the lives of the kids in your community. The name of the show, again, is We Choose Respect, and you can find out all about it at Jedley.com. Joining us on the line right now from a little town in the southwest, west, southeast corner of Illinois. She's been our guest before. She's back with us today to talk about her, her wonderful book, Follow Me Down to Nicodemus Town. Please welcome back to the show, A. LaFay. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Very glad to be back. We're really happy to have you back. The A in A LaFay stands for Alexandria. So um, I'm going to refer, that's when I refer to Alexandria, that's who I'm talking about. Tell us about Follow Me Down to Nicodemus Town. Well, you know, it kind of is a unwritten sequel or a secret sequel to a picture book I did a few years ago for Cinco Puntos Press called um, Walking Home to Rosie Lee. Um I wrote a novel. It's kind of like a book that became a book that became a book that became a book. Uh But (laughs) I wrote a novel called Stella Stands Alone for Simon & Schuster Mm -hmm. about a young girl named Stella Reed who inherits her father's plantation. He wanted to um, divide the plantation up amongst the people his father had enslaved. So... um, he was going to give each of them a plot of land. And when his neighbors found out, they killed him. Mm. Her mother died of yellow fever. So it falls to Stella Reed to um, make good on her father's promise. Hence the Stella stands alone idea. Mm-hmm. Well, in doing, in doing the research for that book, um, her best friend in that book is a young girl named Hattie, who was unfortunately owned by a plantation owner, the next plantation over over. Mm -hmm. And so in doing the research for that book, I realized a lot of elements of African-American history from that time period were really not discussed. Mm -hmm. For instance, one of the ways that plantation owners forced African-American families to stay attached to their plantations and become sharecroppers is they declared the children wards of the state because they didn't have birth certificates and they didn't have marriage license. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't legally prove that the children were theirs. So they forced them into apprenticeship as wards of the state until they were 21 years old, which basically re-enslaved them. Mm 
And the parents had great difficulty being able to get marriage license um, to prove that they were in fact married and that this was their child. Additionally, many of the the parents were struggling to find children that had been sold away from them previously. And so walking home to Rosie Lee is actually the story of a young boy named Gabriel who's trying to find his mama, Rosie Lee, who was sold away from him several years earlier. And I wanted, I started thinking about, well, um, what happened to Gabriel? Where, what was the next chapter of his life? Mm -hmm. And, that's when I came across Exodusters. So it's like the word Exodus, mm -hmm. but it's Exodusters. And those are African-American homesteaders. They established homesteads in states predominantly in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. And a group of them established the town of Nicodemus, Kansas. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if Gabriel was part of that movement. Well, he would have been an adult by the mm -hmm. time the Exodusters um, were traveling to their new homes. So I thought, well, I'll tell the story through the perspective of his daughter. And his daughter's name is Dede. And so she tells the story of how they moved from being sharecroppers to establishing a homestead in Nicodemus, Kansas. And that was the beginning of that story. Wow. Wow. It's such, such an amazing journey about such an amazing journey. And yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you. Hearing this, hearing this story and being reminded of not only of this time in, in our history where human beings were owned by other human beings, but after this, after the sacrifices were made and after the civil war was, was fought and that, that, that those, those victims were still being victimized, um, by the, you know, b b using legal ways. And, and I, I'm, I'm tongue tied here because it just, I, I, it just makes me so sad to, yes, well, uh, to understand that this and be reminded that this happened. Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, we see a lot of coverage of the Civil War, emancipation, and things of that nature. But what, what doesn't get covered is the Reconstruction Era. Mm -hmm. And a big part of why the Reconstruction Era is not highly featured in classes in um, high schools and colleges is because it was a devastating chapter in American history. Um, it demonstrated the degree to which... Um, Americans, uh, European Americans were not dedicated to the freedom of African Americans because a lot of times, um, the Civil War is boiled down to free state versus quote unquote slave state. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't that simple. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the North, uh, did very little to assist African Americans who were still imprisoned by the economic systems of the South. And uh, we see some of that legacy today. You exactly. Know, you know, they're, they're, exactly. Uh, and, 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 and so talk about that more because I, I don't want to even pretend that I'm knowledgeable in this area and, um, I, I want to learn and I want to, I, I want to learn more so that we can do more. Well, let's uh, let's start with the history first and move forward slowly. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, for instance, during the Civil War, many African Americans actually went to um, officers who were at a captain rank or above to get married mm -hmm. because they wanted a legal document to prove their marriage. And. Um, at the end of the Civil War, there was a concerted effort to destroy these logbooks, um, to destroy the record of these people being married. Um, there was a couple from Texas who went to the county clerk's office every day for three years to get their marriage license. They started going in 1866 and did not get their marriage license issued to them until 1869. The 
county clerk would um, would tell them that they couldn't be served until all the European Americans had been served. And then when it, they finally came to the end of the line, the clerk would close the window. Mm-hmm. And so it it wasn't um, it. They were hiding behind legality mm-hmm. because they were destroying records that would have made these people's unions legal in the eyes of the law. And, you know, the only reason African-Americans didn't have marriage license is because they weren't allowed them, mm-hmm. not because these people didn't have committed monogamous marriages that if they if it were up to them would last a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um and so what happens is that many of these people were not allowed to move on and go north in what is known as the Great Migration, which is African Americans moving into cities further north to find jobs outside of the agricultural system of the South. Mm-hmm. So a lot of them couldn't do it because they were looking for relatives that were still in the South. They were tied to the original plantation lands because their children were in a forced apprenticeship. Um, and one of the things to think about is the, the effort to find these lost family members was very difficult because when they were sold away, they could have had one name, but when they were brought to a new plantation, they may have been forced to take on a new name. Um, and just because they were sold to one plantation when they were three years old doesn't mean they stayed there for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And for many of these African Americans, they didn't know how to read and write. So it's not like they could send information out in a newspaper to say, this is who I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the federal government established a concept called the Freedmen's Bureau. And those businesses were intended to help African Americans um, establish themselves and build a better future. When Southern governments realized the degree to which Freedmen's Bureaus could help African Americans, they would put them in um, derelict buildings and then condemn the building and then not offer them another place to go. Um, there were some of them that were actually um, placed inside of temporary buildings that people had built for the purpose of being able to keep offering these services. Um, and because one of the sad things is, is that Abraham Lincoln ran for reelection um, during the Civil War mm-hmm. and he wanted to create a way to have to show that he was willing to negotiate with the South if they were willing to negotiate with him. So he actually chose Andrew Johnson, a Southern Democrat, as his running mate. Well, Lincoln never thought he was going to die in April of 1865. He never thought about the fact that if something happened to him, Johnson would become president. Um, And Johnson was a terrible president. He was actually the only president to successfully be impeached. And he was far more interested in having people like him than doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And as a Southerner, he basically caved to a lot of Southern demands. And one of those demands was to have the Freedmen's Bureaus disbanded. Mm -hmm. And so what happens at that point is a lot of – this was going on – from um, even before the war ended that a lot of African-American churches were establishing newspapers that were dedicated um, that a portion of each newspaper was dedicated to helping families reunite. And they had to use descriptions like I had a child uh, born on such and such a plantation in such and such a state who was missing the bottom half of his ear. They had to use, um, distinguishing body features that wouldn't change over time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to try and find um, their family members. Mm -hmm. You know, I I guess if I'm putting my, my, myself in the, in the minds of a uh, parent who's listening, who has a 
seven or eight or nine year old child, maybe maybe the thought that comes to, to their mind is, I, I don't I don't want my kids to have to, to, to listen to all this. This is this is horrible. Um, I have I have the exact opposite feeling <laughs> because I want my kids to know about this. Uh, and and you know they're older now, but I think every, we need to understand this so that it it doesn't happen again. We need. I completely agree, and and we need to understand it not just so it doesn't happen again, mm-hmm. but so that we have a context for what people are talking about with the fact that racism is a systemic issue, mm-hmm. and that. It permeates so many layers of society and in so many ways that people aren't even aware. Um, and, you know, an example of this problem is if you ask 10 people who were the exodusters, 10 of them will probably say to you, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You have to get to much bigger numbers before you start finding people who know who they were mm-hmm. and what they did. Mm-hmm. And so I really think that the only way to change that is to have um, kids be informed Mm -hmm. because um, if the world that a child is raised in is a world that focuses on social justice, it focuses on equity, it focuses on an understanding of the past and how the past shaped our present, then these issues will not allow be allowed to continue. Mm -hmm. And if we're leading ourselves with this false idea that we can protect our children from the truth, um, I think we're missing the point. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, You know, and one of the things is, is that while there's a lot about these chapters of history that is very difficult, the books that I have written, Walking Home to Rosie Lee and Follow Me Down to Nicodemus Town, do look at the hardships, but their focus is on the triumphs. Mm-hmm. And the the reason for that is twofold. One, I see these books as an entry point to these subjects. And I want the door to be wide open. And I want kids to come in and say what really happened in this time period and to gain a sense of human connection to those people who lived them and also to ignite their curiosity to look deeper. Mm-hmm. So I would really love... It, if families and teachers would use these books as a means to say, what else don't I know? Mm. And to keep looking. I, I, Take, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I love, I love that. I, I, I love the idea of, of sparking kids' curiosities, not only so that they can dig in and, 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 and really get to the root of, of this story, but also to want to know, okay, well, if, if this stuff was hidden away, what else was hidden away? Who else was hurt? Who else uh, is continuing to be hurt because of the way these systems are set up? Exactly. Exactly. And and I think that um, it's also about looking at how these people triumph despite all the things that were stacked against them. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, <clears throat> you may be familiar with the illustrator Floyd Cooper. Um, he has done an amazing amount of books. Um, his most recent, uh, book is about, um, the Williams sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just does beautiful illustrations and he's a, a wonderful human being as well. And when I posted about follow me down to Nicodemus town, he said, Hey, you know, this reminds me of my grandfather's family because they're from Oklahoma. And he said that um, one of his uncles entered the, the rodeo circuit um, in the 1930s. And this goes to the subject of the fact that when there are most depictions of um, the colonization of the Western states that looks at cowboys and rodeos and cowpokes, it erases African-American involvement. Mm-hmm. And they were very involved. Mm-hmm. It was it was uh, one of the ways in which they were able to establish themselves economically. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, the concept of bulldogging was brought into um, the rodeo circuit by an African American by the last name of Pickett. Oh, cool, cool, very cool. Mm-hmm. 
But, you know, the amazing thing about him is he actually bulldogged. And, and just in case you don't know what bulldogging is, this day and age, it's um, jumping onto a bull uh-huh. and grabbing hold, ringing, ringing its nose and turning it. Okay. That was originally done by dogs. And that's why bulldogs were called bulldogs. Uh-huh. They would jump up and bite this little piece, the philtrum, mm-hmm. on the bull. And that is so painful because of all the nerve endings, it brings the bull to the ground. And they were able to contain the bull and brand it. Well, that practice was outlawed because it was so dangerous. Um, but Pickett actually did it manually himself. So he was a very brave guy. Yeah, that would be one word for it. <laughs> very brave, yeah, a little but crazy. There's a, wonderful, there's a wonderful picture book about him. By the Pinkneys, Andrea and Brian. Oh, cool. We'll have to look that up. So, uh, yeah, you were saying that, 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 uh, um, follow me down to Nicodemus Town. There's, uh, you know, it obviously tells a story of, of tragedy, but there's also this triumph and this triumph of spirit that, that's found in the book. Yes, because these people were basically going to, um, a prairie. They're, so there, there were no resources there except for natural resources. So it's not like they could head to the grocery store or they could um, go to the bank or church or any of those things. All the things that existed in Nicodemus, the town of Nicodemus, were there because this group of people built them. Now, it's very important to note that... Um, You know, it's not like the prairie was empty when they got there. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the 1870s. So by this time, Indian removal, forced Indian removal was a very true and difficult process. Um, And this is also the beginning of the Indian school era when they were forcing American Indian families to um, send their kids to schools to be educated, to be white. Mm -hmm which is another chapter of American history that is often overlooked. Mm -hmm. But um, in this portion of Kansas, um, the people who refer to themselves as the children of the middle waters, um, this day and age, they're known mostly by the name given to them by colonizers, Osage. Um, Their name for themselves, and I apologize for my lack of phonetic knowledge in the Osage language, Mm -hmm. but it's Niukanska. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Niukanska. And so if you listen to the end of that, Kanska, that ah. pronunciation is where Kansas comes from. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. And the Osage were able to negotiate a land deal for many of them to be able to stay in um, the state of Kansas. Um Unfortunately, the next chapter of the Osage history becomes very dark because um, the uh, individuals who wanted to further populate Kansas and Oklahoma with European American settlements did everything they could to force the Osage out. Mm. Um, In Oklahoma, there was a horrific series of murders um, trying to take um, land owned by the Osage by force. And the reason for that is the Osage discovered oil. Uh. The first case um, investigated by the FBI wa- were those murders. Mm-hmm. Wow. <sighs> Just uh, very, very dark chapters in our, in our history. Um but uh i think i think we can use these and again at um i i you know i i don't feel the energy that i normally have cuz this is just such a uh a, a hard a hard discussion to have even for me i mean i'm almost 100 right now and it's uh, hard for me to kind of look back and realize that that as wonderful as this country may be that it was built on the on the backs and on the bones and on the lives of a lot of innocent, innocent people. And, um, again, as, as we said earlier, 
having helping our kids understand this and helping them get curious so that they can find out what other things have been kind of hidden um, is is the best way I think to help us move forward to make sure that we live up to the promise that this country has has always represented. Yes, and I think that that's one of the other reasons I chose Nicodemus, Kansas, because Nicodemus was built by a group of people who decided to work together for the improvement of themselves and each other. Mm -hmm. The survival of the people that established Nicodemus uh, um, was directly dependent upon them banding together and working together to establish the town and to support each other when um, any of them were in periods of difficulty um <clears throat> in the picture book itself uh day day ends up working um at the hotel as a shoe shine um and the um and and by doing that she gets to the, meet the new people coming into town and the business people who are staying there and you know she inserts herself in town life even though they live on a homestead outside of town and in their first winter <clears throat> when they um, were having great difficulty being able to hunt enough to keep their family fed. Um, uh, Day Day goes out hunting um, with her father, and she kind of gets lost because one of the things about living on the prairie is there aren't a lot of landmarks. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> once you lose sight of home, it's very difficult to find your way if you're not good um navigating by the sun mm -hmm. and so she finds herself literally in over her head and <clears throat> while she's uh searching for her dad she meets a man who has been watching the fire coming out of their their dugout their home and as he sees that the fire the smoke is getting thin he knows they're running out of fuel mm -hmm. and that tells him that they may not have enough food so he's come with with a brace of rabbits to help them. He says, saw your chimney smoke go thin, figured your food might be as scarce as your fuel. And um, that's how the patents, Dede's family meets Sean Kasabe of the Children of the Middle Waters. So here's an example of how the Osage did offer assistance to the settlers of Nicodemus, Kansas, to help um, members of that community survive their first winter there. Mm, mm, beautiful, beautiful. Well, I absolutely think that uh, Follow Me Down to Nicodemus Town is a, a, could be a very, very important book to have in your family library. Um, you know, one of the things that we've quoted here is uh, a statistic that, say, that says having as few as 20 books in a family library can greatly increase a child's chance to go to university. Uh, I think this is one of those books that should be amongst those, those 20 because like we were talking about, this is a book that really not only tells a story but can spark an imagination and t can help you help your child develop a way of thinking and a, and a curiosity that's going to help them get to the truth. And, and that's so important nowadays. You know, you're on social media and television and, and who's telling the truth and this one is telling this. You, you watch one channel and, and you know, you know, one network covers an event a, a completely different way than, than the next network. And you're sitting there shaking your head going, what really happened? We're, we're looking at the same picture and there's two different stories here, or maybe five, six different stories. So helping our kids start being curious to get to the bottom of whatever it is, whether it's history or whether it's current events, to really kind of dig down and get to the truth of the matter, I think is really, really important. It's going to serve them some greatly. Um, but speaking of university – oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, before we, we, before we go that way, because yes. that was a nice segue – but <clears throat> I want to let parents know about an article by a man named Howard Miller. Okay. He, um, he did an article several, quite a few years ago um, called Who Owns History? And I'll try to find a link to that so that when I post this uh, podcast to uh, social media, I'll include a link to his, a PDF of his article. Mm -hmm. But the reason I want to do that is because he was a supporter of a theory called New Historicism. 
And new historicism has many different features to it, but it's based on the idea that um, all history is an interpretation. It doesn't matter who created the account of history. It is still one perspective. Mm -hmm. And that one of the best things we can do for children is to teach them how to be critical of depictions of history Mm -hmm. and teach them how to do a concept called triangulation, which is the idea that if you read an account of history, like follow me down to Nicodemus town, you shouldn't take it at face value. Mm -hmm. You should look at at least two other sources that talk about the same thing and say, where do I see the truth of this text being reinforced by depictions of other texts? Mm -hmm. So that children can learn to have critical analysis skills about depictions of history or culture or any other aspect of um, uh, identity that they're seeing portrayed in history or even contemporary news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful, I'm just thinking about how, Unusual it is for an author to come on and go, hey, uh, don't tell your kid that this is absolutely perfect. T- t- tell them to pick up other books about the same subject so that they can understand, get the full picture of it. Because uh, you know, I'm, j- I'm looking at it through one set of eyes and there are other authors who look at it from another perspective. And uh, what a great, great lesson. Um, we were, I was segueing. Earlier, we were talking about yes. university and about having our kids go to university. Well, Alexandria is has a very really fun opportunity for any uh, anybody out there interested in writing children's books or writing. Uh, so, why don't you tell us about it, Alexandria? Sure, I'd love to. Um, <clears throat> during the the academic year, I teach uh, in the English department for the Center of uh, Visual Culture and Media Studies at Greenville University here in Illinois. But in the summer, um, I frequently have the opportunity to, to teach in a really exciting um, MFA program. And MFA just stands for Master of Fine Arts. So it's a g- graduate degree, and <clears throat> you can get the degree in writing for children. You can get it in the critical analysis of children's literature, or you can get, and that one is an MA, or you can get it in illustration. And they also have a combined degree that allows you to study how to write and draw um, or paint um, books for kids. And so this summer, I'm actually going to be teaching a a book called um, Genre Study in the Craft, Research and Creative Writing. So it's basically, it kind of segues into what we were talking about, how we create depictions of reality in our books. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to write about, um, exodusters, you have to do a lot of research. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't do the research well if no one teaches you how to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so basically this class is how to do the research required to be a good writer. Oh, fantastic. Or how to do the proper research to be a good critical, a good critic of children's literature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fabulous. So, so where can folks find out more about this class? Um, they can go to, they can do a search for Hollins is spelled H O L L I N S and it's in Roanoke, Virginia. So just do MFA, um, children and young adults, Hollins university, and it'll come right up. Awesome. And where can folks go to find out more about the wonderful books from a LaFay? Well, there's two places I'd like to direct you. Um, I have, well, three. Um, uh, my website is alafay.com. Um, second, I have a, uh, supportive creative community called Sylvanosity, um, which is a word I made up, which in my mind means using your creative gifts to make the world a better place. Mm. Um, and Sylvanosity can be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and that is spelled, um, and I got to write this down because the dyslexics <laughs> among us have difficulty with spelling. I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> so it's S Y L V A N O C I T Y. That's S Y L V A N O C I T Y. But if you have difficulty finding it, just look for my last name, L A F A Y E. 
Awesome. Um, and the third place is please support independent bookstores and go to IndieBound to buy your books. Awesome. 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 Well, we've had a, an absolutely fascinating conversation. I, I feel like I just, I just started my MFA or my master's in, in, <laughs> in me and understanding me and how I feel. Uh, we've been talking, we started talking off about follow me down to Nicodemus town and, and then we went, all over the place in, in wonderful, wonderful ways. It was a beautiful journey. Thank you so much for being with us. Our guest today has been the wonderful author, Alexandria, also known as A. LaFay. Alexandria, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. And I just have to say, since we didn't mention it, um, Follow Me Down to Nicodemus Town is published by Albert Whitman. And it is illustrated by the superbly talented Nicole Tagel. Nicole Tadju is the illustrator. Yes, she is. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexandria. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to talk to you again. Have a great day. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We have two phenomenal guests on the author and illustrator of 10 Rules of the Birthday Wish Beth Ferry, Tom Lichtenhell, they'll be our guests. We hope you'll be with us too. If you are the author of a great children's book, we would love for you to be a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Being a guest gives you a chance to tell thousands of people all over the United States and all over the world all about your great children's book. Being a guest on the show, it's fun, it's easy, and it doesn't cost a thing. You can learn more about it by visiting our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the contact button. Let us know about your great book. We will let you know the next easy steps. We want to thank A. LaFay, Alexandria LaFay for being here today. Be sure to check out Follow Me Down in Nicodemus Town, a really, really important really important book to add to your family library and for you and your child to have some really, really powerful conversations around. We also want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And thank you so much for making the world a better, more caring, loving place. And you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.